And our scripture lesson is taken from the book of Job. Job has been having a hard time of it. He's a good man, but he is upset with God. And in the 38th chapter, God replies. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you, and you shall declare for me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of water may cover you? Can you send forth lightning so that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds or who can till the water skins of the heavens? when the dust runs into a mass and clogs the earth? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young cry to God and wander about for lack of food? This is the word of God. So how many of you have been to Niagara Falls? You know what I really like at Niagara Falls are those, those chintzy museums. They, they don't have the really good one anymore with the, with the mangy animals that were stuffed in about 1900. But one thing I do remember, it's a Daredevil's Museum, and reading about a guy called, who was known by his stage name as Charles Blondin, one of the Daredevils. And uh, in, um, on uh, June 28, 1859, Charles Blondin advertised that he was going to run a cable across the gorge, across Niagara Falls, and he was going to tightrope walk across. 25,000 people came to Niagara Falls that day by train. Some went to the Canadian side, some went to the American side. He started on the American side and uh, he, had, he had strung a cable. It wasn't made out of metal. It was made out of hemp rope. They tied it around an oak tree over on the American side. There was nothing over on the Canadian side, so they tied it around a rock. He had, he had guy, guy ropes uh, attached from the edge to, to intervals along the rope every 20 feet. And I have to say imperial because that's all it was back then except for the center where the ropes wouldn't reach. And so there was a drop in the center of about 60 feet that was about 160 feet above the gorge. So it was, it was quite the little walk. So he started off, he had an, a pole, wood pole made out of ash. It was 26 feet long. And he began to walk across the cable. There, was a lot, there were a lot of bookies in the crowd that day. They were taking bets on whether or not he would make it. The smart money was that he would not make it. And he started off walking. He, he was not a, a, a retiring kind of guy. He was wearing a, a pink bodysuit with spangles so he could catch the sun at about five o'clock in the afternoon. He didn't start off walking, he strutted to about third way, a third of the way across. And then he called down for the maid of the mist to anchor below him, lowered a rope, they tied a bottle of wine to it. He pulled it back up, had a drink of wine, lowered the bottle down again, ran all the way to the Canadian side, which as we all know has a better view anyways. On the Canadian side, he tied one of those great big daguerreotype 
cameras to his back. And after about 200 feet on the way back, he stopped, took off the camera, set it up, took a picture of the crowd on the American side and made it all to the way to the end. So when he got to the American side, he shouted, I'm going to do this again on the 4th of July. Who thinks I can do it? And everybody said, yeah, 4th of July came, even bigger crowd. This time, halfway across the cable. He did not, he did not take a balancing pull this time, halfway across. He lay down on the rope. Then he flipped over on the rope and began walking backwards all the way to Canada. Then he stopped again, took a, swig on a, uh, took a swig out of his flask, and on the way back from Canada, he put a bag over his head so that he had to cross blind all the way back. July 5th, he announced, I'm going to do it again. Do you think I can do it? Everybody shouted, yes. And he did it. He, this time he walked backwards all the way to Canada, pushed a wheelbarrow to the American side, Two weeks later, he somersaulted and backflipped his way across, and he stopped a couple of times to dangle from the cable by one hand. And every time, the crowds got bigger, and his stunts got more outrageous. Every time, Blondin asked the crowd, do you think I can do it? And they roared, yes! Do you think I can do it in shackles? Yes! And he did it. Do you think I could do it pushing a wheelbarrow? Yes! And he did it. Do you think I could do it riding someone piggyback on my back? Yes! You could do it! Then he asked for a volunteer. <laughs> Silence. He had to go all the way to Canada by himself, but he came back with his manager, <laughs> Harry Colner, on his back. Now, if you were there, would you have believed that he could do it? Yeah, actually on the way back, several of the guy, the, the, the hemp rope was getting old, several of the guy wires snapped <laughs> when he was walking back with his manager on his back. Um, I wouldn't have gone on any kind of bet because this guy was using people as a prop. <laughs> so he's clearly a man of tremendous ability, but would you trust him with your life? Hmm. And that was Job's dilemma with God. Let's recap the story of Job in the Old Testament. Job was the richest man in the district, but on a single day, he was wiped out. The Sabaeans ran off with all his donkeys and oxen and killed his servants, and then lightning struck his sheep barn and killed, burnt all the sheep and the shepherds, and then Chaldeans came in from the desert and took his camels and his camel drivers, and all of his ten kids were in a house when a big hurricane came and knocked the house flat, killing them all. And then Job came down with some awful oozy skin disease from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And then his wife told him that she wishes he was dead. And Job was so miserable. He prayed to God, please let me die. But his heart kept beating. And he prayed to God, or just let the sun stop. Just let the sun just go out. But the sun rose every day and kept shining. And he said, oh God, make the day I was born never have happened. But of course, that wasn't going to happen. And all this, even though Job was a very good man, he was a very religious man, he had to keep asking God, why are these things happening to me? Job had four well-meaning but insufferable friends who came to comfort him by giving him answers as to why this was happening to him. And listen, I know this happens when you lose loved ones. People come and they say things that are not helpful. God needed another angel. No, just don't. Only the good... I mean, Really, don't, don't ever, don't come up with answers. But these guys, for 36 chapters of answers, 36 chapters of, of answers, and they explained to him, listen, Job, everybody knows God is into justice. They said, everybody knows that bad thing, God makes bad things happen to bad people, and good things happen to good people. They said, you must have done something to bring this on yourself. 
Maybe, maybe you don't remember, maybe you robbed a beggar. Maybe, maybe somebody came to you looking for food and you refused them. Or maybe, maybe you cheated a widow and an orphan. But Job hadn't done any of those things. His burning question was, after all those years of being close to God, why was God so silent now when he really, really needed him? If he only knew where God was hiding out, God, Job would go and tell him his troubles and get at least get some kind of explanation. But God was dead silent. He called out, I cry to you and you do not answer me. He said, and with the might of your hand, you persecute me. And after 38 long chapters, and you know this if you've ever tried to read the book of Job, God finally speaks, which gets us to today's chapter, scripture. But God does not say what we think God should say or would say. And you know how many of Job's questions he answers? None. You know who starts asking questions instead? God. Incidentally, in the New Testament, you'll find with very few exceptions, when people ask Jesus a question, he answers with another question. It's a teaching technique. God asks, and Job, were you there when I laid the foundations of the universe? Have you gone into the springs at the bottom of the ocean? Have you walked in the deepest valleys of the deep? Do you know where light comes from? Have you, have you gone to the place where snow is stored before it falls? Do you know who causes the rain or how it's caused? Can you bind the chain of the Pleiades? Have you, given, have you put wisdom in the clouds? Can you give understanding to the fog? Is the wild ox willing to serve you, Job? Will the wild ox spend the night in your barn? Have you given the horse strength? Does the hawk fly because of your wisdom and know enough to go south? I mean, clearly the answer to all of these questions is no. But what's the point of God giving questions when we're looking for answers? Why does God do that? I'm going to give you three things. I know it's always three things, but that's the most I can remember. <laughs> Why does God ask questions when we're looking for answers? First of all, because we need to ask ourselves the question that God's asking. This is one of the questions God is asking. This is a hard adult question, which means we don't like it very much, but it's the right thing. Who gives the orders when we pray? And who obeys? Is God my servant at my beck and call? Or am I God's servant at God's command? When we're babies, we have it made. If you're hungry, all you have to do is open your mouth and call for your staff. They come. If you are, it's three o'clock in the morning, if you're a baby, all you have to do is scream. And someone will be right there, whether they want to be or not. But an amazing thing happens. I'm watching this with our grandchild. When you get to about two, and you decide you will not have supper tonight on the blue dish because you wish to have the yellow dish, not everybody is at your beck and call the same way they were before. In fact, sometimes you have to wait. In fact, sometimes you can throw your stuff on the floor. People don't pick it up for you immediately. And when you get to about two years old, you know, one of our observations is that toddlers do not really care for that transition because they liked the system where the world was at their service. Yes, of course. 
So what is the meaning of God's tirade of questions? The first question, God is forcing Job to reflect on who is in charge of the universe and who owes whom an explanation and who is there to serve whom. And second meaning of God's questions for Job and us is to realize there are some things in this world that we try to understand, that we want to understand, that we would understand, but they're just over our head. I mean, I remember uh, my, um, in the 60s, my dad worked for Lytton Electronics. He was on the team that made the, the um, communication system for the Apollo space mission. And so he would bring all kinds of space stuff, technology home, to show us I mean, things that nobody had ever seen before, like Velcro. That was invented for, for NASA. And he used to bring these electronic circuit boards with these little wee transistors uh, soldered onto a board with, with lines of copper between them. And I remember him trying to answer my nine-year-old questions while he tried to explain to me why ones and zeros going very, very fast could communicate to people thousands of miles away in outer space. And that just made no sense to me at all. And he patiently explained it to me even more simply, but it just wasn't within the capacity of my mind to understand what he was actually saying. But it got NASA to the moon anyways. And Job could not possibly have seen or understood the big plan behind his life. He, Job could not have known that Satan was testing him. He could not have known that his perseverance and his suffering would bring courage and comfort to millions of people who have read the book of Job over the millennia when they've endured times of hardship. Job could not have known that he would marry again and that he would have children again and that everything he had lost would be restored to him except doubled. He could not have known that. He would not have understood it. God is saying, Job, do you know how little you know and how little you would understand if I actually told you directly? So there's this issue of respect. God is not our servant. We are God's servant. There's the issue of understanding. We don't know the big picture. And there's a third point. And this is a dilemma for us often. God is all powerful and God is also good. So if something bad happens and it happens either does that mean God is bad or that God is good and not able to do anything? Or is God able to do something and God is bad and just doesn't want to? What the book of Job teaches is that God is all powerful and God is also good and loving and we don't understand how those pieces intersect until we come to the cross, to Jesus Christ, who is genuinely a man with no fault, who endured unjust suffering, was utterly forsaken on the cross, <coughs> who rose from the dead in God's great plan of redemption. <coughs> Job came to this place where he could finally say, God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. And even if you kill me, I'm still going to trust you. I would cross Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow if you were pushing it. He doesn't actually say that, but he would have if he thought of it. And I'm going to end with an anonymous prayer that was written by somebody who had read the book of Job. I just reflect on these words. This may not mean anything to you. You may never have been in that time 
of great pain and great unfairness and great suffering. But for those who will and who have, it's better to understand these things in advance than to be lost in that pit in the center of it without any, any comprehension of scripture or the comfort that God gives us when we're there. This is what the prayer said. I asked God to give me happiness and God said, actually, I'm giving you blessings. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare me pain. God said, suffering can draw you apart from worldly cares and bring you closer to me. I asked God to make my spirit grow. God said, you're going to grow, but on the way, I'm going to prune you to make you more fruitful. I asked for all things so that I might enjoy life. God said, I've given you life so that you may enjoy all things. I asked God to help me love others as much as he loves me. And God said, aha, now you've got the idea. <laughs> 